talk to you about some reinforced concrete, specifically a single reinforced concrete beam. Now, we've got a whole bunch of videos where we talk about the math behind it, uh, some of the theory that goes into the design and analysis, and we're going to include links for those below, and then great textbooks, two of them that are awesome for learning about reinforced concrete. These are college level textbooks and they will take you through the whole thing. Um, and which one is my favorite? That's Whitney's. This one's my favorite. And the reason why I like this one so much is how they list the assumptions. And I think that's one of the toughest part about being an engineer is knowing the assumptions and sometimes you gotta make up your own assumptions, but knowing the assumptions and it's more than just memorizing them because I have them listed right over here but it's internalizing the practical application of the assumptions and what that means so we're gonna dive into that in a real quick video for your Saturday morning so let's just go right into it so the three assumptions the first oh and by the way this is our rudimentary reinforced single reinforced concrete beam where the whole thing is made out of concrete and in our bottom section, we have our steel that's going to take over our tension zone. And then, of course, we have our concrete Whitney block that will take over the stress in our compression zone. So the three assumptions that we use when going through the design and analysis of a reinforced concrete beam or even a concrete structure, the first one, strain distribution is assumed to be linear. What that means is plane sections remain plane. Another way of saying that is when the concrete beam does start bending, when it goes through its failure mode, what we are analyzing and designing for are very, very small deflections. And the reason why we say small deflections, it, it's more of a practical reason. Once we start getting into that failure mode, we've gone past what we can do with the algorithms or formulas that we're going to be playing with when we go through this analysis and design. It, it makes the math a lot easier and once it starts going through those failure modes, depending on how the beam is designed, they can be catastrophic, they can be fast, and the uh, math can be a lot more difficult. Okay. Assumption number two, strain in steel and surrounding concrete is the same prior to cracking of the concrete and yielding of the steel. Um, and the reason why we say that the steel and the concrete are one is because we have to assume that they are acting as a true composite material. If our assumption included that there was a certain amount of slip here, that the steel wasn't working with the concrete, then no matter what we did, we wouldn't be able to get this balance into our design or through our analysis. Oh, I forgot to. So that was assumption number one, and I think we just got through assumption number two, where we assume this is acting as a perfect homogeneous composite. It's acting together, where the steel and the concrete are one. Now, it's only because of the type of reinforcement that we've designed throughout the history of reinforced concrete and our algorithms or our equations that we can actually do that. All right, let's go on to number three. The third one I don't necessarily agree with, and I feel like at certain points it can be dangerous. We assume that concrete is weak in tension. I know that's no surprise. That being said, that assumption was created a very long time ago. Now, we have certain concrete mixes, high performance, ultra high performance, where we have been able to toughen the concrete through playing with the hydrated cement matrix with nanoparticles or other things out there, as well as using different types of fibers. So assuming the concrete is weak in tension, and again, I had to look at the words just to make sure I was saying it right, but assuming that concrete is weak in tension, we might either be wasting money or creating an imbalance between the compression and tension side and doing something that might cause premature failure of our concrete structure. 
there's a real reason why the general public needs to understand this stuff. And we can actually do this for single reinforced beams, for concrete columns, for walls. There was a bridge failure in Italy last month, this month? Genoa, uh, Italy. Yeah. Catastrophic failure, bad things happened. Now, I'm not putting the blame on it, but there are bridges that are going through the same premature or failure scenario here in the States that the bridge in Italy went through. And it was a combination of, I guess, poor engineering. I, I really don't know the whole story, but when you look at the pictures of it, there was also deterioration. There's a bridge in New York that I would refuse to drive over with my family. The bridge was over 40 years old. And the columns holding up the bridge were made out of timber, and the timber was family. Now, that bridge was a huge bridge that was one of the main thoroughfares in New York. A lot of traffic. Now, they just started repairing the bridge last year or the year before. But I refused to take my family on that bridge. And if you understood the dynamics, or not the dynamics, that's the wrong word, understood even to a small degree that this balance of this concrete to make sure that it withstands your car rolling over it is based on strength and geometry as well as the steel. If I start losing concrete, I start losing two things. The geometry or the mass of concrete that creates my compression zone and then the concrete that's going to protect the steel in my tension zone, right? So once we start doing that, we compromise the integrity of that structure. And that's not only for beams, that's also for the columns and bridges. Or Hoboken, New Jersey. We had just moved there. It has one of the oldest train stations in America, and it has some of the oldest engineering in America too. Some of the foundation that they've built these mega structures on are built on wooden columns. They had number of sections but there, there was a portion, I thought there was a soccer field, a portion of the soccer field mm -hmm. that fell into the Hudson River. Don't believe me, look it up, the foundation failed. And if you saw it and you knew the original material, you knew the original diameter of the column, and now you saw the deteriorated portion, you would be able to confidently say, holy shit, I need to get away from that. So some of the reason why this is important for you out there who's not interested in concrete and the people that I care about is I want you to be able to recognize what catastrophe could, affirm, could occur. And if you drive on Santa Fe in Denver, those, those columns for the underpasses underneath the rail, they're failing. Like you can see the steel. And it just takes the right distribution of weight or the right amount of loss here, here, and not here to take that balance away and do that catastrophic failure. So, yeah, it's boring. I get it. But it's important. And plus, it's exciting. Okay, so thank you very much. I hope you learned something. I have a lot of fun. I know it got serious there, but I have a lot of fun talking about this stuff. And if you do see failed concrete structures um, or any type of failed structure, send us a picture and we can explain it to you. We have some fun puck and as well as some interviews where we talk about cool concrete structures that are being refurbished or that are going to what we think is going to be a failure scenario. Um, but if you ever have any concrete questions or comments or concerns, let us know. Like, subscribe. Go concrete. Beat asphalt. <laughs>